Susan Neiman, welcome to the podcast. I'm glad to be here. Um, so your last book has the thesis in its title. It's called uh, Left is Not Woke. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I could also say that woke is not left. I wrote this book for partly to figure out my own confusion, but it was a confusion that was reflected in conversations I had been having with friends in many different countries, all of whom their whole lives uh, stood on the side of the left and suddenly felt and said, what is this? Maybe I'm not left anymore. And that struck me as wrong, but no one had quite teased out what the difference and uh, the problems are. Um, I didn't want to give up the word left. And I wanted to write a short book setting out what I consider to be left liberal principles. Those are two different things. And distinguishing them from the woke. In a nutshell, the very short thesis is that woke is fueled by traditional left-wing emotions, um, having your uh, empathy for people who've been marginalized, wanting to correct historical uh, discrimination and oppression. Um, as you know, there's a German saying, das Herz schlägt links, yeah? your heart is on the left side of your body. But the woke are undermined by what are actually very reactionary theoretical assumptions. And you do not have had to, ha you do not have to have read um, Carl Schmitt or Michel Foucault in order to share those assumptions. Those are assumptions that have gotten into the water stream because every journalist went to college and picked up certain claims coming from these quite reactionary sources that are now often transmitted in the media as if they were self-evident truths. So I wanted to show the gap between genuine left-wing philosophical assumptions and the premises that the woke are often acting on. So it's not. And so explain to us a little bit where the distinction lies, because somebody who uh, defends the sort of identitarian left, somebody who defends the quote unquote woke, might say, "Well, like, listen, I mean, the origin of a word, which has now become this kind of." Uh, you know, that term, which is often just used in this pejorative sense, is to be awoken. And what we meant by that is to be awoken to injustices, and particularly to injustices facing marginalized groups. Um, and so, uh, you know, in fact, some of what you briefly telegraphed uh, about left liberal principles, that you have compassion, that um, you, you have empathy, uh, that you understand the experiences of marginalized people. But that's just precisely what woke is all about. Now, I disagree with that as well, but I think that's going to be the sort of standard response that people give. So what does that get wrong? Why is it that to yeah, be woke is not just to be, you know, rightly empathetic towards the real suffering, the real injustices facing marginalized groups? Because empathy and compassion are emotions, and they're important emotions, um, but they're not principles. So let me lay out what I think are three liberal left principles that are violated by the woke. The first is traditionally the left has always been on the side of universalism rather than tribalism. Tribalism has always been a conservative view, suggesting that the only people you will have real connections with and therefore real obligations to are people who belong to your tribe. Okay, um, And for universalists on the liberal left, your tribe could encompass the entire world. Of course, you have certain affinities to people who get your jokes or understand your illusions. But to be a universalist is to work hard to try and understand what are going on in other cultures that are not your own. So that's the first difference between left and liberal. The second difference is that you believe there's a principal difference between justice and power. Again, uh, a really major achievement of the Enlightenment. Of course, there were signs of it before the Enlightenment. But the idea that your claims to representation uh, are claims about justice, that it's not simply the strongest uh, person or group of people in the neighborhood, 
but that people deserve certain rights on the basis of human dignity uh, is a claim about justice. Now, obviously, these are things that get Confuse the Iraq War is a great example. Um, George W. Bush, we've forgotten how outraged we were 20 years ago when claims about spreading democracy and ending tyranny were used for um, really as um, uh, hype to dress up certain claims about power. And that happens all the time. But what many of the woke have concluded is because because claims to justice or universal justice have been abused, they are nothing but claims to power. And you have someone like uh, Foucault, uh, who's made that a principle of his entire work. So that's the second principle on which liberals and leftists agree. Third one is a belief in the possibility of progress. And this gets a little tricky because, of course, I know woke activists who do believe that uh, they're working towards progress, ending racial, sexist, homophobic discrimination, and those are all good things. But if you don't actually believe that progress has taken place in the past, it's very hard to develop the will to make more. So claims like nothing has changed in the United States since slavery, or you know we're still living under a patriarchy that hasn't fundamentally changed, is a statement about um, really the futility of actual change that undermines efforts to make some. And there's a fourth principle that probably would be accepted by most of the woke and isn't accepted by many liberals. Uh, and that's what makes me a part of the left rather than a liberal. I believe that social rights are human rights. All this was codified in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, which is an aspirational doctrine. But it means that things like uh, fair labor practices, uh, education, health care, uh, access to culture are social rights. They're not benefits. They're not privileges. They're not um safety nets, their rights in the same way that the right to travel or the right to speak are rights. And I think most people on the woke would probably agree with that, um, but um, many liberals don't. I am happy to have as big a tent as possible. I think we are facing what really needs to be called by its name. It's not authoritarianism. There are signs of fascism in many countries in the world. And I would be delighted if um, liberals and leftists would get together on this score. There are people, a number of people have been afraid that my writing this book and using woke as something of a term of abuse, it's not, I'm not snarky about it. I get the, the woke. My kids are woke. Um, I, you know, have many friends who would consider themselves in that part of the spectrum. And many people were concerned that I would be giving aid and comfort to Ron DeSantis or who knows what else. I haven't done that. Um, I haven't, I, first of all, I say on the first page of the book that I'm a socialist and a leftist, not a liberal. Secondly, uh, there are certain places where I haven't appeared and won't appear. Um, I'm not joining woke bashing. I'm really trying to, um, to provoke some serious thinking about what has gone wrong in the so-called woke left that I fear is actually driving some people's some people's move to the right or the center right. But I think certainly cases of the people I know leading to just a, a resignation and a sense of despair about being politically involved at all. Well, I think in any case, there's just a wrong thesis about the world that people often have when they reflect about journalism or, or or public writing where they sort of say, well, you know, certain things are inconvenient, certain things might be used by the other side because we're on the wrong side of it. So if we only we sort of enforce silence about it, then people won't discover that we're wrong about it yes. and it'll sort of stop them from being able to to take over. And I think that really is actually a vote of no confidence in ordinary people because it assumes that you can pull the wool over their eyes. Um, when in reality, I think 
um, addressing those uh, points in an, in an open and clear way gives them confidence that they might want to listen to you on, on the rest of it. If they look at a left that is united in defending ideas that they find to be wrong-headed, why would they trust the left on anything else? Whereas if they see a debate within the left where people are willing to say, hey, these points we agree on, these other points, um, you know, there's some people in our ranks that I don't agree on, but they might identify themselves with that. So I think that's just sort of, you know, apart from anything else, this is bad social science behind that. But but it also, I mean, it's part, I think, of this, of this atmosphere that we've had over the last years so that's perhaps slightly receding now of, oh my God, I can't say that, which, um, you know, I think one of the leftist principles I would add to the ones you've talked about is a freedom from fear and a freedom from fear to talk and think out loud about the world. And unfortunately, sometimes leftist milieus are very bad at protecting that freedom from fear for their own members. Um, but, I agree but let's... with you entirely. I just didn't want to talk about that. I didn't want to talk about cancel culture because uh, uh, enough good people have said reasonable things about that. I, I wanted to try something new. And what is striking is I, when I started giving book talks about this book um, two months ago, I started by saying this book arose from conversations that I bet you've been having in private. And everyone in the audience would nod and smile and say, yes, but we don't say it out loud. So, Yeah. So let's go through I, I, the fourth principle sort of is a little bit tacked on, I suppose. So let, let's talk to, to, about the three main principles that you that you address. And I think it's helpful to go through them in reverse order, because I think in a way they they build on each other and within the worldview that you're describing, um, where sort of the third principle is the basis. And when you get to the second, when the, the final inference is the first, at least that's how I think of, uh, about these principles. I like, largely agree with you in, in um, work that I have coming out and that, that these are broadly speaking the kind of principles that, um, that help to make up what the world, worldview is. Um, so let's start with this denial of progress. Um, you know, Derek Bell, the founder of uh, critical race theory, really acknowledged as the most important influence on it, uh, once wrote a very influential article called The Permanence of Racism, right? I mean, mm -hmm. even writing in the 70s and 80s, he was saying that, um, you know, really racism had gotten no better in the United States even after the civil rights movement, that um, uh, the nature of racial injustice might permutate, it might become more invisible, but it's just, it's a, it's a historical constant. It hasn't gotten better at all in the United States. So what is your response to that kind of pessimism about whether it is racism in the United States or, you know, forms of identity-based injustice in, in other parts of the world. I mean, I just have to say that it's without any empirical basis. Tell it, in particular, to anybody who grew up in the South um, during uh, the age of what I don't like to call Jim Crow, I would call it the age of racial terror following Brian Stevenson. Um, it, it's... Um, you know, you have this claim also by the Afro pessimists, um, uh, Frank Wilderson and uh, Satya Hartman, and I honestly think it uh, it flies in the face of every fact, every social science fact that we know, but also every anecdotal fact. I mean, I can remember one of my earliest memories. I grew up in Georgia during the civil rights movement. And one of my earliest memories is my mother was involved and was, um, you know, not without some risk uh, working to help desegregate the school system. And I can remember that it was against the law to go swim for black and white children to go swimming together. OK, I can remember the day that the schools were desegregated, but I also remember at that time that there had never been a black cabinet minister and that the idea that there would be an African-American intellectual sitting in the White House for eight years was just not something that anybody imagined at the time. Did the election of Barack Obama and racism? Of course it didn't. It's too deep and long lasting and in some ways systemic a phenomenon um, to, uh, you know, to be ended in one generation. But that enormous progress is made. I just, you know, think about, <laughs> there's another interesting thing that um, people are often too young to remember. It was a big deal when the Supremes got 
onto mainstream radio because there was a classification called race music and black music was played on black radio stations. And when you look at the music industry today that people take for granted, um, it, there's been a sea change. Does this change the life of every poor kid in a Baltimore slum? Of course it doesn't, okay? For that, we need real socioeconomic changes, but that there have been major changes um, in our perception of race and our understanding of it um, just seems, you know, a simple empirical fact. And I would also go on to say this, um, been true about assumptions about women's rights as well in my own lifetime. I've seen major, major changes that have not actually happened as quickly in Germany as they did in the United States, but Germany is often a bit behind. And perhaps we'll, we'll come back to talking about Germany later in the conversation. Um, I, I always wonder sort of why it is that these ways of talking about a lack of progress or this form of pessimism have such an intellectual hold and they have an intellectual hold, um, you know, on different topics in, 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 in different parts of the West, at least. Um, and I wonder whether there's a kind of weird association that we've started to make between pessimism and virtuousness or between how much, how pessimistic you are and how much you care. It's nearly as though sort of, if you're saying, you know, it is, terrible when you're saying i really care about the people who are experiencing injustice and if you're saying look it is very bad there are things that we need to fix um and improve on but actually we've made progress from 40 years ago it's as though you're implying well really we don't need to do anything because things have gotten better so who cares and of course uh, you know as a, as a theory of political action in the background i find that to be wholly unconvincing because in fact if nothing's changed over 70 years despite all of our efforts collectively, um, uh, uh, of members of a minority, of course, but also of, of members of a majority group, then why keep going, right? If racism is permanent and it's never changing, it might change form, but it's never going to become any less bad, well, I may as well play Xbox and have a nice dinner because not whatever, not whatever I do, it's not going to change. Whereas if you say, look, there are continuing injustices that we should fight against, but also we should take solace and optimism from the fact that we've made some improvements and so we're capable of making more improvements. Um, so, so perhaps again, what we're dealing with here in the background is a kind of weird uh, set of social scientific assumptions about what will spur people to action and, 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 and a weird set of, sort of psychological assumptions about uh, you know, what, it, what it indicates about you, how you speak about this, and, and, and perhaps what will make people care. Well, that's a good point. Uh, and I agree with you that it seems much more motivating to believe that some changes have been made in the past and now it's time to make some more than to suggest that, no, it's all just as bad as it always was. But I think there's something else besides a social science assumption. I think there are deep, well, it's a combination of psychological and philosophical assumptions. Um, talking about how everything is worse makes you sound smarter. People who talk about things being, you know, um, yeah, gradually, there's been some progress made, not enough, but this is how things proceed, um, are dismissed as being naive and slightly embarrassing. And there are these philosophical tropes. Once again, you do not have to have read Foucault or Adorno and Horkheimer to make them, but the idea that what looked like progress in the past turned out to be a subtle and insidious form of repression and domination, that is a trope um, that, again, you get in social science, you get in some of the humanities, and then you get into the newspaper and the podcasts and whatever. And it sounds clever, okay? Um, but you could actually deconstruct that just as well as they think they're deconstructing, um, you know, claims about progress. And that's part of what I tried to do in the book. So, 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 so the second principle that you talk about, as I, as I understand it, sort of contrasts power and principles. Um, uh, let, let me put to you how I would think about this, how I've written about this in forthcoming work, and you can respond to me whether we agree or whether you have a sort of slight, slightly different um, spin on it. So, so the way that I think about it is that, you know, of course, um, uh, 
many societies have failed to live up to the noble values that they've, you know, written uh, on the packaging. Um, Roughly the, all of in, us, the, but yeah. Right. So the, the United States Constitution, when it was written, was a beautiful document. And obviously, mm -hmm. uh, the racial reality of the United States continued to be uh, 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 terrible for um, 150 years and, 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 and continued to be deeply troubled uh, uh, well, well, well beyond that. Um, now, I, I think there's a fundamental question that you then have about do you try to live up to the principles or do you discard them? And where I take to be the core difference, the core distinction between what I would call the liberal left and, and, and the identitarian left is that those of us in the liberal left say, look, um, we have to redouble our efforts to live up to these principles, but we have made historical progress and we've made historical progress in part because of the demands of people to be treated in accordance with the principles that this society invokes. The civil rights movement was, among other things, Martin Luther King Jr. saying, you've made us a promise, a promissory note, and we want to cash that check. We want to be, in fact, treated in accordance with principles that you claim to be living up to. So by what right are you excluding us from it? So that these universal values, in fact, have an emancipatory force, even if they can often be used as um, uh, a, a sort of nice, you know, putting uh, putting lipstick on a on a pig or whatever, right? Um, now, the, 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 the what you would call the woke left, or the identitarian left, uh, rejects this, right? They say, no, 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 these principles um, have always just been make-believe. They've always just been a way of um, uh, pretending uh, that, uh, that we're living up to these principles. And in fact, the function is precisely to perpetuate this injustice. So therefore, we have to get rid of those principles. And if right. we get rid of those principles, the only thing that's left is group power. And so then um, at the entire left somehow hopes that through a series of social transformations, uh, the logic of group power, which used to uh, uh, benefit the, the white majority or the male uh, dominant group or the you know whatever dimension you're looking at, somehow by a miraculous transmutation is now going to uh, structurally favor the people who used to be oppressed. And so, you know, I think there's a principled objection to this, but that's not the kind of society of power struggle that I want to live in. And there's a practical objection, which is what on earth makes you so confident that the people who've always been oppressed, who've been in the minority, will suddenly be powerful enough that they can impose the group will on the others rather than this, you know, competition for group struggle, for group power, uh, once again, benefiting the dominant group. So, so that's sort of how I would put this point. Um, how I, I'm I sure you have a spin on it. Yeah, I agree with you entirely, uh, with every word. And it's a dispute, in interestingly enough, though people forget it. They always think they've invented it. It's a dispute that goes back to the dispute between Socrates and, and, the, and the sophists, okay? The claim that every cl discussion of justice uh, amounts to an assertion of power and an attempt to pull the wool over people's eyes. So it's a very old um, discussion, but you're absolutely right. Um, I am on the side of uh, people like Frederick Douglass or Sojourner Truth. I mean, it goes all the way, way before Martin Luther King. And interestingly enough, African Americans have been in the forefront of those who pushed America to live up to the ideals that it proclaimed and didn't realize. There's also an interesting debate right now about colonialism and post-colonial theory, which I find extraordinarily problematic because it depends mostly on those governments and you see it being, sorry, on those arguments. And you see governments like uh, Narendra Modi saying, oh, human rights is a Western imposition. And besides, you know, you colonized us and there are no universal principles of justice. Um, that's just simply not true. And fortunately, there are some writers from formerly colonized countries who are speaking up uh, against that sort of abuse now. And I uh, quote some of them in my book. But it's a it's it's a rather nefarious sort of um, move. Again, it's an old move. It's a it's two thousand five hundred years old, and um, Socrates had a hard time refuting it then. But we have to keep refuting it in every generation. I think. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned Frederick Douglass. I think "What to the Slaves of the Fourth of July" is perhaps the classic text in the American 
tradition that defends the uh, idea and the strategy of uh, living up to these values and demanding inclusion of those values rather than uh, uh, dismissing them because they are so often hypocritical as of course they were in, in, in Frederick Douglass's time as he states very bluntly in, in, in that wonderful speech. Um, uh, I want to push you on one thing here. Um, uh, I'm a, a left liberal, I suppose. You, you say you're a socialist liberal. Um, so, so, so let me push you on this particular point because uh, as you're saying, um, the conflict between people who are saying we should respond to hypocrisy by ceasing to be hypocritical or we should respond to hypocrisy by getting rid of the values and the rules that aren't consistently followed it goes back to Socrates. Uh, but one of the very important instantiations of it was in the history of socialism. Now, I don't think that broadly speaking, the tradition we're talking about is just a form of quote-unquote cultural Marxism. I think that's a misunderstanding, oh, and we agree on that. I wish um, it were. <laughs> and, and that I'm will come back to it. But, but there is an important parallel here, right, which is that 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 that, that socialists and, and, and Marxists have always said that about liberal democracy. They have said, you know, the the rules of bourgeois democracy are just, uh, you know, a, a, a set of illusions that are meant to pull the wool over the eyes of the proletariat, right? All of the constitutions of the world are just the sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, notes um, by the uh, uh, committee to defend the bourgeoisie. And so, therefore, any genuine progress uh, entails the exact same kind of rejection of uh, uh, neutral rules and universal values uh, that now the identitarian left in different form is asking for. So uh, I, I guess, uh, do you think that there is this parallel between the rejection today uh, by the quote-unquote woke of, uh, of, 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 of this aspiration to living up to those principles and the way in which a lot of the Marxist tradition talked about it, um, I'll be yeah, some of Marx, yeah, some uh, of Marx, the, the Marxist tradition talked about it, and and which side of that debate do you stand on when it comes to, uh, to, to issues of class? In a lot of the um, Marxist texts, you do have that position, which is why I don't call myself a Marxist. I'm a socialist, and I wrote about that uh, in a book I wrote 15 years ago, Moral Clarity, about where I think Marx went wrong on that score. Although in some of his writings, especially the early writings, it looks like he's saying something closer to what you and I believe, which is that um, liberalism claims to uphold certain principles of equality, fraternity, and liberty, but without thinking about the material means to realize those principles, it leaves a huge portion of the population, in fact, without the means to liberty um, or equality. So, um, you know, That's sort I, of the social democratic reading of the early Marx. You know, it, yeah, you know, it's, it's I mean, uh, if, if we want to talk socialist theory, um, I, I think probably my favorite uh, socialist theorist is uh, Edward Bernstein, one of the founders of the German Social Democratic Party. I can call myself a social democrat or a democratic socialist, but I stick to the term socialist partly to provoke people, partly to remind people that there was a socialist tradition in the English speaking world that has been pretty much wiped out of consciousness. People are astonished when they realize that Albert Einstein wrote an essay defending socialism in uh, 1947, beginning of the McCarthy era. Okay. Um, and we tend to forget, and I think this is uh, not an accident, that there's many forms of socialism, at least, as there are forms of capitalism. I don't think the left really worked through what went wrong in 1991 or 1989, whichever date you prefer, I think 91. The collapse of state socialism and this one model that uh, was, you know, repressive and authoritarian and problematic in all kinds of ways um, left a lot of people feeling helpless. I can remember people who had spent years debating what kind of a socialist they were, right? not whether they were a socialist. Um, and I'm thinking of several different countries. 
um, just saying, oh, gosh, I guess, I, you know, it always led straight to the gulag and I was mistaken and this is the end of history. And I actually think that is a huge reason for the development of woke, because it seemed to people that large scale universalist political projects had been um, proved hopeless, if not wrong. And the thing to focus on was individual and group identities. I don't like the word identity politics because it reduces all the identities we have down to two and also down to the two that we're actually, um, we have the least form of agency in. Okay. But I do think that the lack of reflection on the left and the sense of, of, you know, just helplessness and hopelessness about what it might mean to have a real universalist left-wing project that would be um, global. Um, lack of reflection about what went wrong has led to this interning um, about, you know, defending my group, figuring out my group identity uh, and that Ubalis. Yeah, just just on a side note about identity politics, I agree with you that that's not a helpful term, in part because there are certain forms of identity politics that are a perfectly natural part of democracy. You always are going to have some forms of group interest representation, right? I mean, the, the American Association of Retired Peoples, um, uh, uh, or retired persons, is a very, um, you know, normal kind of form of democratic politics. Here's an identity group, people who are old, um, of retirement age, and we're going to defend their interests. Um, you might think that sometimes the ARP has a positive impact on the world, sometimes perhaps has a negative impact in over-prioritizing the, 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 the interests of a particular demographic group, but it's a perfectly legitimate form of politics. And the same, I would say, is true of, you know, associations representing um, Armenian immigrants in the United States and, and perhaps putting pressure on Congress to recognize um, uh, by name, what, what what happened in in Armenia after 1918, and so on, right? So there's forms of interest group politics that have an identity base that are legitimate. Where it becomes illegitimate is when you want to make it the very basis of the principles of a society. Well, I think there's a fundamental difference between interest and principles. Okay, and you know, while I, I think it, here's a difference between us, I would kind of shrug my shoulders and say, well, there will always be interest group politics, but I would look forward to a time when the interests were not tribal. Um, and this is why I, I write in the book, I don't consider myself an ally. I mean, the reason why I would support, say, Black Lives Matter in certain phases is not because it's in my interest in any way, shape or form. It's because shooting unarmed people of color is a violation of human rights. And interestingly enough, Arendt picked this up in Eichmann in Jerusalem and did not uh, emphasize it enough at the time. And I don't think she realized how important it was. She said Eichmann should have been uh, indicted for crimes against humanity, not for crimes against the Jewish people, uh, because what he did was a crime against humanity. So allies are people who have shared interests for a while, like the United States and the Soviet Union, um, and then suddenly they didn't anymore. But you can principally support a struggle out of solidarity because you believe that human rights are being violated. Yeah, no, and I, I think we, 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 we do absolutely agree uh, on that. Um, uh, I think it becomes particularly relevant when it comes to questions uh, surrounding both standpoint theory and political allyship. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of uh, left identitarian view, which roughly speaking says, if we are from different identity groups, then you're never going to be able to fully understand me and my experience, especially if I'm more, more, more oppressed or disadvantaged than you in some kind of way. And so rather than understanding my experience, you should simply defer to me. And when it comes to political action, um, uh, you shouldn't think for yourself what the right thing to do is. You should say, I'm an ally to that group and that group demands this. So therefore I too am going to demand that that happen. And I think that is wrong. Um, just epistemologically, um, I think that in fact we are capable, if we put in the relevant work, to understand the politically relevant experiences of people. We may never quite feel it 100%, but we can um, uh, come to understand certainly why the experiences are unjust by listening with an open mind 
to uh, what they tell us about uh, uh, the way that the world looks to them and the experiences that they have. And then I precisely think that the number of people who are ever going to defer the judgment in this kind of way is going to be very, very limited. It's only people who are already incredibly committed to political action. And even those will always pick spokespeople from the group with whom they already agree. They're going to say, oh, I, I, I think we should do that because this group is saying that, but they're going to pick the spokesperson for that group who already agrees with them about what kind of political action is needed. And a much more realistic uh, model of political agency is to say, no, actually, I believe that, uh, you know, a black man in the United States should be able to walk down the street without fear of the police. And I believe that uh, a woman should be able to be uh, on the subway without uh, being fearful of being uh, harassed. Um, and I believe, you know, that gays and lesbians should be able to uh, go to a bar without fearing that we're going to be beaten up. And it's not that I'm deferring to their judgment because I'm an ally to their communities that uh, I'm going to be upset if those principles are violated. It's because I have my own ideas about the kind of society I want to live in and that I think we should all collectively want to live in. And when those yes, principles well, are violated, I, I want to make the world more just. And that's the reason why I'm standing up in this situation. Yes, well, we agree on that as well. Um, you know, the problem is if you carry the you can't possibly understand my experience line far enough, none of us can understand anyone. I mean, this is, there's a line of the, a couple of lines in, in analytic philosophy that actually claim, you know, we can never know uh, another person's standpoint, even if they come from our tribe. So um, this is, for me, the point of uh, great literature, great music, great film, which is why I'm uh, extremely um, annoyed by the claims about cultural appropriation, precisely the function of, of great art is to help us understand better both ourselves, but also um, a culture that is not ours. And um, yeah, I mean, there are other, other arguments against the cultural appropriation claim, which is that most cultural products are the products of appropriation. Appropriation is, of course, not the same thing as exploitation. We all know that it's um, taken place. But um, if you pay some attention to other people's cultures, learn at least another language or two, you will never be able to do it for, you know, the plurality of different cultures in the world. But I always argue that making an attempt to walk around in two other cultures besides your own, it can't just be one, okay? If it's one, then you're in this permanent, well, here they do it like that, and there they do it like that. But just to realize um, that there are many different perspectives on the world um, gives you, first of all, a perspective on yourself, and secondly, a, a sense into uh, a sense of someone others. I came up with a metaphor that I find compelling in the book um, about flesh and bones. And I look at cultural differences as being like flesh. And of course, I'm not in favor of doing away with flesh. Flesh is interesting. It's in different colors and sizes and shapes and all of that. But the bones are the things that tie us together. And the bones are also the things that remain of us after we're gone. So cultural pluralism is a wonderful thing, but political universalism is the thing that holds us together. So we've worked our way up from principle three to principle two, and I think it's getting time to principle one. So if you believe that uh, the world remains unjust in many important ways, but we have actually been able to make progress. And if you reject the idea that uh, universal principles are always hypocritical. If you think, no, actually, part of how we've made this progress is by living up more fully to uh, to, to these principles. Um, uh, then you're left at number three with, so perhaps we need to reevaluate uh, universalism, which has needed to become a dirty word uh, mm -hmm. in big parts of political discourse and, and particularly on the left. So... Um, Make us your most passionate case for 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 you know you know capital U universalism. Well, I started with this metaphor of flesh and bones that you know uh, 
committing yourself to universalism hardly uh, commits you to the idea that everybody is just alike. And it also commits, doesn't commit you to uh, the move that tends to be made on the left and particularly in post-colonial circles of saying, ah, this talk about European, uh, uh, this talk about universal values is just cover for a white European patriarchal scam that was trying to make everyone else like them. Um, in fact, you find principles of universalism in many, many cultures, okay? And um, what particularly annoys me about this post-colonial critique of the Enlightenment is that it actually comes from the Enlightenment itself. It's usually not um, made by people who, I think, read more than 10 words, um, and usually in a Wikipedia article, of the Enlightenment, but the idea that Europeans, European Americans, should look at the world from other than Euro, Euro, European perspectives comes straight out of the Enlightenment, as I'm sure you know. Um, you know, it was the Enlightenment that took this trope, uh, starting with Montesquieu, of criticizing Europe from the perspective of fictionalized. Persians, Chinese, indigenous South American priests, Tahitians, um, you know, the, the entire reproach about Eurocentrism uh, was invented by the Enlightenment, okay? And there's a, this excellent but not perhaps 100% accurate book that came out last year by David Graeber and David Wengro, The um, Dawn of Everything. They actually argue that a lot of Enlightenment political philosophy came out of not just fictitious non-Europeans, but a real non-European, a member of the Huron tribe um, in, uh, in Canada. It's now Canada. Um, it's not clear uh, that, that their research there is conclusive, but what is clear is that thinkers of the Enlightenment were incredibly interested in reports and ideas coming from non-European places, specifically about things like the patriarchy, like patriarchal marriage laws and um, treatment of women that was different in other cultures, um, about property relations that was certainly different uh, were different in um, indigenous North Americans whom they were in contact with. And uh, you know, what's what's so strange about this is that those thinkers actually risked something, in some cases, their lives. The uh, philosopher <clears throat> Christian Wolff, who was a big influence on Immanuel Kant, even if very few people have heard of him today, um, gave a lecture arguing that um, the Chinese, he studied some Confucius and some Mencius, and he argued that the Chinese had a perfectly good system of morals, even though they weren't Christians. And for this, he was ordered to leave not just his university position, but the entire state of Prussia in 48 hours or to uh, face execution. Okay. So this is not a Twitter storm. This is, these people were standing up for a genuine universalism that encompassed, you know, and learned from other countries. And it's all over Enlightenment texts if you actually, if anybody actually bothers to read them. Um, so it, I, let's, you, let's just, let's just, I, I like the way that you connected all three of the principles that I'm using for the liberal left. I would have done it in the other direction, but I do say in the beginning, they're all interconnected because um, if you are not a universalist. You base your principles on tribal claims, which are fundamentally interests of power and not principles. And if you base your politics on tribal interests, you know, then it's very unlikely that we're going to make any genuine progress. You will have an eternal struggle of all against all that, you know, may accidentally turn up to be more just in one period than another, um, but probably no one will be around to recognize it. 
you know, the one worry I have about this conversation is that we've agreed about too much. So I want to <laughs> hone in on something where we where we might disagree, which is a different sort of things that 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 you've worked on. Um, you know, we're both Jewish and we've both spent parts of our lives in Germany. We sort of spent, as I understand it, different parts of our lives in Germany. We should say that I grew up there and then I moved away and you grew up in America and then you moved there. Um, uh, but uh, you, you have argued in the past that uh, there are many things that other countries can learn from how Germany has dealt uh, with its dark past. Um, and uh, you know, I obviously broadly agree that Germany has much, done much better on that count than Japan, for example. I was in the uh, uh, very moving uh, area of Hiroshima, which commemorates the dropping of the bomb a few months ago. But I was very struck in the museum about Hiroshima that, um, you know, the reasons for Japan's entry into World War II are you know, barely alluded to in a half sentence in one display. Um, uh, and other than that, uh, you know, this day is just presented without any kind of context about what, what Japan did in, in, in World War II, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, probably the Japanese model is closer to the rule than it is to being the exception. Um, the sort of extent to which Germany has grabbed oh, the past yeah. has, has long been quite exceptional. So I recognize that, you know, what Germans call Vergangenheitsbewältigung, uh, yeah. it's the oh, process God. of dealing with the past has been quite important and remarkable. As somebody who, who's grown up in Germany uh, with a, you know, as a Jew, um, I have to say for that I'm, I'm rather more skeptical than I think you have been about how some of that has played out, both about how thoroughly it's shaped society, but also perhaps about whether an over-obsession with it, which I think did mark the German public, at least for a period in, in the 90s and 2000s, was ultimately helpful to building uh, a better society. And, 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 and I personally, growing up there, often experienced the sort of extent to which Germans thought about uh, what Germany is and whether you're a good German as uh, uh, sort of channeled through how are we going to think about the past and therefore how are we going to treat the few Jews who are still around today um, as a real obstacle to, to friendship and to contact with people. Um, I often found that precisely the most noble Germans, precisely those who are most keen to, 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 to grapple with the lessons of the past and to prove that they moved beyond it and that they were not guilty of any of the sins of... Uh, the ancestors, or at least the co-nationals, were the ones who ended up treating me when I was growing up in a kind of creepy, overly zuvorkommend, overly oh, sort of friendly. Yasha, so Yasha, I, I, yeah. Let me let me say a couple of things because I did read your first book, and um, I, I, I'll tell you what my thought was. Here's somebody who grows up in a small town in Bavaria. And he comes to Cambridge, Mass, and he feels suddenly free, okay? And I get that entirely. But you see, I grew up in the South, as a Jew in the South, which was extremely different than moving to Cambridge, Mass, which I also did at the age of 19, or New York at the age of 17. And just to make sure that I have a, a window on what it's still like in the South, I spent, uh, you know, more than a, half a year in Mississippi researching that book. And boy, being a Jew is still just as problematic in Mississippi, less so in Atlanta. Um, but, um, you know, but I still celebrated the fact that a Jew and a black man were elected to the Senate from Georgia. I, I'm a hopeful person, not an optimistic person, but a hopeful person. I didn't think it was going to happen. OK, so, um, you know, going from a small town in Bavaria to, you know, New York or Cambridge is, is very true? different, um, you know, uh, believe me, people are as as icky and uncomfortable about Jews in certain ways in other parts of the U.S. Um, as uh, as they are in parts of Germany. Now, that being said, um, I wrote that book, uh, was finished four and a half years ago, 
And I have found myself in the past couple of years uh, quoting my um, late, much lamented friend, Tony Judd, uh, when the facts change, I changed my mind. What do you do, sir? When I was began to write that book, I thought that the, especially in Berlin, I, I, I must say that I've, you know, I travel to other parts of Germany for work and stuff. There's no other place that I would live in Germany than Berlin in the way that I my guess is you would only gravitate to uh, metropolitan eastern seaboard cities, okay? Um, Berlin has become an extraordinarily mixed place. And it's not just a few Jews anymore. It's uh, it's the largest, the fastest growing Jewish community in Europe. So um, there is, a, including some estimated 20,000 Israelis. So um, it's, it is the one place that I would feel comfortable living in in Germany, but it too has, and here I agree with you, I think um, the last three years for political reasons that I'm not going to explain to an American audience, I'm in the process of writing a longer piece on this in English, um, things have gotten significantly worse in the past three years where an over-focus on German crimes of the past has led to two things that are uh, incredibly problematic. One is it leaves Germany absolutely unable to talk about what's going on in the present, particularly in the state of Israel. But secondly, it winds up thinking that the only voices that count, the only Jewish voices that count are the voices that talk about Jewish victimhood. They have completely forgotten about Jewish universalists. They put people on postage stamps when they're dead, you know, but from Moses Mendelssohn to Hannah Arendt, um, the Jews of the past, German Jews of the past who are mourned were all universalists. And at the moment, the focus on German crimes, you know, they've all learned the lesson, Jews were our victims, we murdered them, leads people to see um, authentic Jewish voices as the ones who cry anti-Semitism the loudest at any occasion. Now, this relates, just, just two more sentences. Um, my involvement, I've been very politically engaged in this in the last couple of years in Germany, um, has also led me to think about and partly to, it flowed into my thinking in left is not woke, because I fear that a similar view is gaining hold in the United States, that the people of color who are listened to seriously are those who talk most about the permanence of racism, and those who you know, go against that line are dismissed, are called conservatives when they're liberal Democrats, um, you know, those who present an alternative, much more universalist view. So I I see parallels and problems now in both places that I didn't see five years ago when I was writing that book. Uh, so perhaps that leads us to slightly different assessments of how Germany has changed in, in the last years. I, I agree with some of what you said about that, but but to me, uh, I feel freer as a Jew in German today than I did 15 or 20 years ago. And that's in part perhaps because some of those questions of my identity and my upbringing have become less central to me. Perhaps writing that first book of mine was a form of exorcism as well. Um, but it is, I think, also because Germany has changed. And one of the ways in which Germany, I think, has changed in a good way is that, in my mind, it's become less, much less obsessed with its past. That to think about what, what it is like to be a good German today and what German identity is and how we should think about the nation now depends in part on your opinion about what we did or should have done in 2016, 2017 during the refugee crisis. It depends in part on what you think today about all kinds of social and cultural policies. It depends on whether you're comfortable with an increasingly diverse Germany in which Jews are present, but many, many other groups are present as well. And I think all of that transformation has put Jews 
a little bit less in the foreground than we were in the public debate in the 90s and 2000s. And actually, I think that's been incredibly positive. So I would add one more parallel to the one that you offered, which I agreed with, which is that one of the reasons why I have been constitutionally allergic to certain forms of uh, left identitarian discourse and practice in the United States is that I sometimes felt I was being asked to treat people who belong to minority groups in the United States in the way that I was treated sure. by people exactly. with the best of intentions growing up in Germany. And I knew how that made me feel and that that was not a path towards a genuine form of equality. And that's why I wasn't able and willing to go along with it. No, I agree with you entirely. But I should say, first of all, I came to Germany in 1982. I don't know how old you were in 1982, but I think I'm about a generation older than you are. I, I was born in 1982. Okay. So, um, so I experienced both at that time um, pretty problematic, uh, straightforward anti-Semitism, but also the absolute weirdness and unpleasantness of, of philo-Semitism. So, so I've been through all that. And I left uh, Berlin uh, at the end of 1988, uh, having had my first child here, thinking I did not want to bring up a child in that kind of weird environment. Totally agreed. I decided to come back in 1998 um, because I was convinced that Germany had changed in all the ways. I mean, well, I came back in 2000, 1998. We finally got rid of the CDU and we had a social Democrat green government and they put in a lot of changes, also a lot of symbolic changes. And one could see uh, that there was a genuinely uh, a, a different attitude, not just to Jews, but to people from different cultures altogether. So absolutely, I really did think that Germany was going in in very much the right direction until exactly three years ago. If you've been, I know you've been doing lots of other things. So if you haven't been following our our, our local, what I call philosemitic McCarthyism, um, it's, um, that's fine. Um, but it's it's problematic, um, but I think if we're if we're only talking about uh, the last before, um, you know, 2019, 2020, then I think we're, we actually probably do agree on something else, Yasha. So this has been a yeah, it's been lovely. Well, I think uh, I think on this topic, perhaps on the other topic, perhaps we agree to eighty percent here. Perhaps we agree to sixty percent, but. We'll, we'll, we'll need to deepen this in, in another conversation. Just, just very briefly at the end, in one minute or less, um, if people agree with you on the main thesis of what you've been talking about, um, and they think of themselves as left-wing, and they're in a milieu that is very left-wing, and they're worried about making the points you just made to their friends and colleagues and so on, do you have any advice for yes, how for to sure. speak up for those ideas without first, losing, you know, without ceasing to be in good standing with your leftist social circle? First of all, speak up. You will find that many more people agree with you um, and will say things like, I was going to say that, but I was afraid to. Um, I mean, it has happened to me many, many times. I think the second um, question that everybody should ask themselves and ask their friends and colleagues is, list 10 identities that are crucial to your being. And I think everybody will find, first of all, it's hard to restrict yourself to 10, but you certainly will not restrict yourself to two, which is race and gender. And to think about why essentializing people um, just a couple of decades ago on the basis of these two categories over which they have quite little agency, um, and to think about what it means to you to be a person who makes decisions, who acts in the world, who's an agent, um, raise those questions with your friends and colleagues, and um, you'll be surprised at the positive reactions that you get. Susan Neiman, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Pleasure.